ever talking with them again is something that's very difficult to believe. If you've lived with someone for a long time, for example. And so what we're actually giving them an opportunity to do is recognise that death has occurred. We're not beautifying it, we're not taking it away. We're just giving them a chance to see what is real, but at the same time, giving them a chance to see somebody who looks peaceful, comfortable, and at, and at rest. I know there's nobody in there. I know they've died. And I know their soul is no longer in their body. But that doesn't stop me thinking of them as a person. For their family, they are still their husband, their wife, their child. And they will be until they're able to do that releasing, which is what our job's all about. Untying the bonds of relationship with them and enabling them to say the words that are so precious like goodbye, I love you, I'm sorry. You see, we're not trying to hide the fact that they're dead. That would be stupid. That would, that would just hold up the process of grief. That would be silly. But in fact, seeing somebody and recognizing that they are dead, but comfortable, but at peace, then they can start to make the journey of recovery. It is a journey and it often takes a long time. But we're setting their feet on the right path, if you like. We're setting it up for them, doing our little bit towards it. That's why I like embalming. It makes a difference to other people. It's, it's a service. It's a, it's a good job. So we're going to test for death, all right? And undress the lady, making quite sure that we've got a modesty cloth in place, all right? Sheila Dix teaches undertakers the art of embalming on a diploma course, which lasts for nine months. And this can go in your waist bin. First thing we're going to do, is just to wash the eyeball carefully and we just check perfectly obviously you can see signs in the eye of decomposition already taking place all right keep the eyes closed because that's only um, right and proper test for death all right we've established that this then um, has in fact um, done you're all funeral directors already and i think for most of you you could honestly say that it's a job you thoroughly enjoy doing that you get enormous satisfaction and pleasure from. And what we're really doing in this course is just widening that scope. Our families, you already know, entrust to us something very precious, something very valuable. Yesterday, the person whom you are going to embalm today was probably still alive and living in the home or living in the hospital, and their relatives were talking to them and doing all those personal things that one does with the people one loves. Today, that person is in our care. The family have entrusted him to us. And we've got to care. If we're going to do our job properly, that's exactly what we have to do, care, care very much. You see, the family's not here to see what we do. We can do anything. They won't know, they won't see, we will, we'll see, and we'll know whether we've let ourselves and our profession down. And I think right at the very outset, we've got to get this fixed in our heads. The other thing we've got to remember is that the dead cannot speak for themselves. They're helpless. And so because of that very helplessness, perhaps, we have a greater charge than ever. Right. 
Now, immediately under the skin, you find the muscle groups. Look, the muscle here, from the clavicle up to the, that's the, um, from the clavicle running up to the um, temporal bone there. And the other group of muscles just by the side of the windpipe. I'm just going to go through that layer. There's a small layer of fat there. And underneath there will be the, will be the vein. Can you see the blood in that vein? It's dark blue. Now, anybody who hasn't seen, just come. Right, Malcolm. Okay. Right, now we've just got to dissect that out. Um, get it clear of the underlying tissue. Got to be a little careful in somebody who has died a day or two ago, just to make sure you don't puncture the vein. And there it is. Now you see it's, there's still some blood in it, so we're still able to identify it. We'll just slip the separator underneath it. There's the vein raised. It's very easy to talk about bodies when you're an embalmer. And then you stop thinking about people. And to me, there really isn't any difference between what I do in, if you like, almost in love for them on the embalming table, some of these things being unpleasant. However much those things are happening, I'm doing it in order to achieve the purpose, which is there in the chapel. So the dignity of the individual, hopefully, is, is never out of my head. I, I pray that it never is, because the minute that happens to me, all sorts of things are going to go wrong. Nowadays, the dead are rarely laid out at home, but are kept in funeral parlours until cremation or burial. In the cities, some 75% of all dead people are embalmed, although in many cases the relatives are unaware it's happened. Undertakers don't use the word embalming. They usually call it hygienic treatment or care of the body. Wherever you go, if you you have to fill in a form somewhere. Somebody asks you, your profession, and you say embalmer. They either think you're mad, they think you're some sort of a loony, or they start asking, what's an embalmer? Possibly um, there, might, there, there might be a tendency for the profession to draw eccentric people uh, and slightly strange people toward it. Um, as an embalmer, I, I do feel in some way um, separate from the rest of society. In, in as much as um, I'm privileged uh, to, to, to deal with a, a function which, which is unique. Alan Lee and John Fulton have their own embalming company. They work on contract to one of the largest undertakers in this country. It takes about an hour to embalm a body. The 
family will be charged some £35 as part of the cost of the funeral. The amount of work each case involves varies greatly, depending on the condition of the body at death. But the trade embalmer is still paid a flat rate, £20 a body. This is a straightforward female case. I'm just washing the body down with a solution of disinfectant in order to kill surface bacteria to, in order to protect ourselves really and anyone else who should handle the body after embalming. Um, Hygiene is really one of the basic aspects of embalming. Uh, and obviously we have to be extremely careful. We can never be sure that we're not dealing with a case which has died or suffered from a, a communicable disease. You know, you, you could show somebody, you could show someone the difference between this is a body which is before embalming and this is a, a body after embalming. And then they might understand. It's, it's, it's incredible. Embalming is, uh, to me, it's... Um, I've, I'm feeling emotional, emotional now when I'm, when I'm describing it, when I'm talking about it. It's such a wonderful, a wonderful thing. someone else whilst I was initially getting to grips with embalming before I actually had a lot of experience. In the initial stages when I had to first had to, to make incisions and things, I felt that I was somebody else. I pretended to be somebody else and I just did what they told me to, be, to do robotically. I just did it without actually trying to experience it. I shut myself off from the experience. Once I'd done that a few times, I could then release myself and allow myself to experience it properly. And I think I, d I do that with everything that I find disturbing, because it is disturbing initially. Because it's dead bodies and you've been brought up to be uh, disturbed by them, everybody thinks dead body a terrible thing. To put it simply, we replace the blood with embalming fluid and this uh, serves three functions one of them is the preservation of the body that is it halts the onset of decomposition temporarily the, uh, the body would have eventually decompose if it's not of course cremated and it will also enhance the appearance of the body and it will also make the body hygienic to handle. I'm about to insert a tube into the artery. This pump gives us pressure, pushes the fluid in. Massage the hands in order to attract fluid down into this area. And already we can see the veins rising. So along there. And that's where the formal uh, is going in, pushing out the blood. It's displacing the blood. This discoloration. 
which is hypostasis, hypostasis blood. That should clear. Squeeze it in the mouth sometimes. Helps to dislodge it. It's already, there's an improvement. They're not people. That's the thing. I think that's the strong thing that comes over. There are no people in that room except myself. Uh, the coldness, the very cold to touch. So that gives an impression of lifelessness. Uh, to, to touch a person, people are warm. You expect it. But to touch a dead person, initially, is shocking. Because even though you know the dead, you don't expect the coldness that comes through. Despite even though you're wearing gloves. And I, don't, I don't like to touch them without gloves, unless they've been embalmed. Embalming is carried out very often without the client really knowing. Uh, obviously, the, um, the, the funeral director has to uh, obtain some kind of consent from the family for embalming to, to be carried out. But uh, he would often use other terms. But embalming can be carried out. Uh, the work can be done without the client really being aware of what, uh, of, of that anything really has happened. And um, so the, the actual uh, result is there. The, the body looks really nice. Uh, the people are very satisfied, which is the, the important thing. The bereaved are satisfied. Uh, but nobody, they don't know that the embalmer even exists. I like the uh, anonymity. I like to be the anonymous person who is behind the scenes, who isn't meeting relatives. I think because I'm introvert, I feel introvert. The funeral director has got to be extrovert. He's got to meet clients, he's got to play, uh, he's got to act. I can't act. And I don't like the meeting of relatives. I'd rather be behind the scenes, producing the results that are liked or are disliked or people are indifferent to it, whatever. But, you know, I don't like to, to be up front, as it were. But I like the results to be up front. And, and the body is the most important part of the funeral. It's the most important guest at the funeral. And I've got to make him look or uh, look right. The most important part is the face of the embalming because that's what the part that the people are going to see. You know, the rest is covered up. And this is what they're interested in. So this is where we spend the time, really, if we can. I'm now going to suture up the mouth or sew it up. Uh, this involves passing a length of ligature around the septum just beneath the, the lips there. And then up through into the nose, through the septum of the nose, back down again into the mouth and tie it up. You do this in order to keep the mouth shut without any artificial means. For example, a prop would look bad. So we do a, a suture that can't be seen. I've certainly not by no means mastered embalming. I've been doing it about four years, constantly, every single day, with a high volume, high workload, case load. And sometimes I would do uh, ten cases in a day when I'm busy, when I'm quiet. I do at least three or four in a day, and that's every day. Sometimes during particularly busy periods, it's easy to imagine that instead of people dying in hospitals or in houses, there is some factory 
produce some bodies for us to work on. Uh, and not that they're coming out of hospitals and, and people are physically dying in houses. It's, it's easy to imagine that sometimes, because you're getting one after another after another. Thanks very much. It was okay. It was difficult. We got all the, the damage. We damaged all down here. What on the right? Right side of the car. And I cut it all out. Cut all the really bad flesh away. And put wax in. And it was okay, but it was beautiful. Trying hard a little bit of it with the uh, face cloth. But most of it, all that side of the face is wax. Mm. And make up all of it, obviously. But they wanted to view it. They wanted to view it. This is the thing. Two, 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 about three hours. Mm. Just to sort of get the mm. feature back to what it was, because all the bones were crushed. Mm. You can never get them 100%, as you know. They insist on viewing them. Yeah, this is the thing. They're definitely going to view it, no matter what. Oh, certainly. They should be pleased. Well, you know what people are like. Yeah. You don't seem to understand a lot of time, I, I, but it's to, sometimes impossible. Yeah. To be quite honest, what I, from what I heard, I didn't think that you would uh, you'd be able to do anything with it at all. Simon Ryan is not coming very well. Mm -hmm. We'll do without Simon. His wife's got an appointment at the hairdresser. Ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's quite simple to work out. A workable system. Well, Jennings is. Jennings is used to work really well. Mm. You never needed. It's just a question of cooperation for yeah. everybody. We, we don't even need cooperation. Mm. Because you don't need a left of one. Mm. So, how many have we got left? Six. It's not so bad. Just lucky that they've you don't brought no more. idea what's coming in. There's nothing to cheat. Could you pass with my side? Okay. If I decide I'm going to do something, it doesn't matter how terrible it is or how uh, obnoxious it is, I will do it. Determination, will, strength of will to do it. I think because if I, if I go into something, I think, well, I'd like to do that, and I don't actually go ahead and do it because I've not got the guts, then I'm disgusted with myself. I think because because I don't, I don't want to. Uh, if, if I have an attitude that everything I'm, I intend doing, I will do. That's the only way to do it. If I, if I start slipping back and say, well, I'd like to do that, but I'm not careful, or I'd like to do that, but it won't work, or I won't be able to do it, then I'll never, I'll never do anything. So if I have an inkling, if I want to do something, I've got to use strength of will. It doesn't matter how terrible it is. I'll do it. I'll force myself through and do it. I suppose the, I don't like people, really, that much. I'm, I don't dislike them. I'm, I'm indifferent to them. I don't need them. You know, if I find people boring, 
if they're not intelligent. I don't prefer dead people to, to live people or anything like that. They're different. They don't... They don't impose themselves on you. I think that's the thing. They don't impose themselves. They're just... They're, they're inanimate. They're, they just accept things. They, they do. They accept things. I mean, dead bodies. And they don't have any views or any opinions. You don't have to deal with them or be anything with them. I think that's how people should be. I know that, that John doesn't agree with, with me uh, about this, but I actually have some belief in, uh, in life after death. Um, I think uh, more in terms of reincarnation rather than uh, in, in some sort of heavenly place uh, where people go to. Uh, it's, it's just, it seems strange that, um, that something which, which had a personality is reduced only simply to what is a dead body. It seems more likely than uh, there just being an end and uh, bodies are disposed of, uh, and that's it. Only yards away from where you've been working is a completely different world where people are alive and are not aware of death. It's not prominent in their minds at all, yet it's an everyday thing to me. And it's sometimes hard, it doesn't correspond really. It's hard to put the two together. The two worlds don't correspond, the world inside the mortuary, working with deceased persons all day, and the world outside where people are walking about, driving home, uh, going about the business, without realising that only yards away, uh, there's so much death. Let Daddy read the story. Samantha was looking. Tim looked at his sister. She was fast asleep. Tim jumped on her to wake her up, but she only said, go away, and went back to sleep again. That's right. If I could choose where I live, mm -hmm. I'd still live. It would be in middle of a field, mm -hmm. away from people. Why have I not got as many as you? I don't want to have contact with them. I don't like going to places where there are lots of people. For example, I don't like neighbours coming in and out, things like that. Everybody tries to impress you. Always, everybody does it. I, mean, I don't like that. Everybody's acting. I find everybody faults. There's very, very, very few people who aren't faults. Um, you know, it's even me, obviously me as well. Everybody, we're all guilty of it, being faults. Sure, don't talk to me. I'll bring it down When I, as an embalmer, receive this body to work on, uh, it's almost like um, receiving uh, a, a for a sculpture, receiving a stone. Uh, you've got to uh, intuitively see the end result. You're receiving this, this, this dead human body, this lifeless corpse, and it's almost as though you have the ability to breathe, albeit illusory, life back into the body. That's, that's really the crux of what we're trying to do with the, the standard, ordinary, normal case. We're trying to recreate life, an illusory life, 
but recreate it. It's necessary through this part of the operation to remove protective gloves. And it's necessary for the actual warmth of our hands to soften the cosmetic cream. This is a, a straightforward case. It's by no means um, a, one of the more difficult cases which we might have to deal with. Um, being a more difficult case would be an, an accident case where uh, considerably more did. In which cases we use a wax to restore the tissues which, which are damaged. The same would apply to some facial cancers. While I think of it, we need to order some fluid and uh, incision powder. How much have we got left? Fluid? Are we in urgent need of it? Well, within a couple of weeks anyway. Falling afterwards. Um, gel as well. Yeah, it's in gel. Yeah. Nothing else? No, no I don't think so. When you're in the presence of deceased persons, I often wonder how how intelligent are they. You can't assess how intelligent they are. And they could be wildly intelligent or they could be stupid or whatever. But they're all the same now. This great leveller is death. Everybody's the same. You know, they have the same expressions on their faces. They assume the same positions. They have the same intelligence. Zero. That's, that's interesting to me. I always wonder where they stood and what sort of a hierarchy they, they held, what positions they held, what they'd achieved. All these things that they've not got anymore, they've lost. They've lost all of their knowledge, all their experience. Everything's gone. It's died with them. It's coming up, please. I just want to check. A lot of people might be put off of embalming because the body, once after embalming, it's, it's taken away and it's, it's cremated or it's buried and nobody sees it again. But the illusion which you've created lasts for the rest of the lives of the family. And that's their last memory which they carry with them for the rest of their life. Considering 
轩炯。